So please welcome to the stage, Sean, definitely not working in porn, Dalton. We're good, okay. All right, now we're good. Uh, thank you very much for the instruction, Luke. Uh, like you said, yes, I am not working in porn. Um, I, I shoot uh, a lot of portraits, a lot of fashion, things like that. Um, so if you didn't guess, yes, I am a photographer. Um, that is what I identify as. Um, but my business model has changed quite a bit since when I first started uh, as a photographer. So today I'm gonna uh, talk to you guys about how my business has changed over, changed over the years, starting out uh, working for a nonprofit organization here in Chiang Mai, doing the nine to five thing, um, transitioning to a uh, client work business model, you know, shooting portraits and things, uh, photography, client work, and to where I am today, uh, a passive income model that lets me travel and pretty much do whatever I want. So my journey starts out in July of 2016. I was 24 years old, I graduated with my master's degree in public health in, in uh, Portland, Oregon. Um, and I, I moved out here, I got a job working for a nonprofit organization here in Chiang Mai, making $500 a month. Doesn't seem like a lot of money, and it wasn't, but I was on the right path. I had a really good resume, I had a master's degree, uh, I had done an internship with the World Health Organization. So for the most part, after this six month uh, paid internship, I was gonna move on and get a good paying job in the field and, and progress over the years. Um, everything was pretty good, and I loved it out here. I had an awesome time in Chiang Mai. It's a great place to live. Um, for those of you that live here, you guys know that. Made a bunch of friends, did a bunch of cool shit. This is uh, uh, Songkran in 2016 or 2017, I'm not sure which one. Uh, that's Tom there, one of the speakers here at this event. Met Johnny, we fell in love, had a beautiful relationship. <laughs> <laughs> Until he left me, he went to Poland, but whatever. Um, so it was great, you know, life in Chiang Mai was great, but I got distracted, okay? So I was working this job for this NGO, but I've been a photographer for my whole life. But photography was one of those things that I never really took seriously. I never thought that I could turn it into something like a job. It was always just like a side hobby for me, especially when I was studying for my master's degree. I was working, I was studying. Photography was not my main priority. But when I got out to Asia, I was like, I couldn't put my camera down. Everything was inspiring for me. Everything, it's like I had my camera with me all the time. And it was great, it was, I had this newfound passion for photography that just like rose up within me. So I started shooting all kinds of stuff. Uh, I became a travel photographer. I started shooting portraits, travel, coffee, food, whatever, anything I could shoot, I was down. I had a really good community of photographers here in Chiang Mai, a Thai and foreigner. Um, and a lot of us grew together. We, we learned from each other, we grew, we had a community. It was awesome. But I was still working for the NGO at this time. I still had a job, a nine to five job. And I was very distracted to the point where I was sitting at my desk writing these fancy academic reports. And I was like, dude, I can't wait to get off and go take pictures like every day. So luckily, uh, my, the, my coworkers, they recognized my, my love for photography. Um, and I got to start shooting for the NGO I was working for. We were in Vietnam, we were working in the field in Vietnam. I got to go along, bring my camera, uh, and this was one of the first experiences that I had using my photography skills for something actually meaningful. Um, and this photo here in the middle was actually used on a publication that I wrote for this, for this organization. Um, and so it, it felt good to be able to make an impact, you know? And then I started shooting small projects around town here in Chiang Mai. Uh, did this photo for Johnny like two years ago. Um, I started doing all, you know, portraits, little projects around town. And then things kind of blew up. <laughs> I started getting work all over the place. Uh, I was traveling to other countries, being hired as a photographer. Um, I got really popular on Instagram. Everything just kind of fell into place. Um, and it was great. I was making good money, business was good. Um, and, I, and at the end of the day, I was doing something that I loved. Right? And that's what we all want. We want to do something that we love and make money from it. And then came the 2017 Nomad Summit. And I was the photographer at this event. Uh, I was the photographer at this event for the past two years. Um, this was in January 2017, so two years ago. And the theme of that conference was leveling up. Kind of like this conference here today, which is, I think, very fitting. 
So the theme was leveling up. And at the end of that day, Johnny asked a question to the crowd. He said, how can you level up your business? I sat there and I was thinking to myself, how can I level up my business? Okay, things are good. I'm a photographer. I'm making decent money. But how can I take it to the next level? In order for me to answer this question, I need to go back two months prior to that Nomad Summit at the Friday Coffee Club, uh, August 12th, 2016. How many of you guys are familiar with the Friday Coffee Club here in, in Chiang Mai? A lot of you. Okay, so every Friday there's a, a digital nomad or digital entrepreneur meetup here in Chiang Mai where everybody can meet and kind of uh, network and things like that. So at this particular event, I was still working for the NGO. I was walking down the street and I see all of these foreigners, right? And I'm like, what's going on? I've never seen this many foreigners in Chiang Mai before. I walk in and there's a guy. And I was like, hey, what's going on? He goes, I'm about to present on copywriting. And that guy was Jesse Forrest. It's this guy right here, a little ring around his head. And this is actually a photo from that day after the conference. So I walk in and Jesse goes, oh, I'm speaking on copywriting. I, I need you guys to understand that I didn't even know what a digital nomad was at this moment in time. Okay, I didn't even know that was a thing. I didn't know you could live somewhere and make money. So news to me, right? Jesse talks about copywriting, which at the time, I thought it was like something to do with law or something. I didn't know copywriting was like some type of actual writing. But more importantly, Jesse spoke about the lifestyle of a digital entrepreneur. And he spoke about how to start, how to start getting jobs as a copywriter, how to find clients, how to navigate platforms like Upwork and things like that. This is all new to me, right? But at this point in time, my mind is blown. I'm like, dude, that's pretty cool. Like, I, I'm living in Thailand, yeah, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm making money, but I'm only making $500 a month, and I'm working in an office. Yes, it's something I enjoy, but it's hard working in an office all day. Like, every day of the week, man, that's tough. So fast forward back to the, the summit, when Johnny asked that question, the things that are going through my mind are actually copywriting, dropshipping, eBay arbitrage, all of these, like, sexy digital nomad terms that we hear when we kind of first learn about what a digital nomad is, right? For me, at this point in time, photography was just a means to an end. I didn't think that it was a business that I could scale simply because it was location bound. I didn't think that I could make it location independent unless I got huge and then people started flying me around the world, but that's pretty difficult to do as a photographer. You gotta be really, really good. nagging him for the past few months. Dude, teach me how to copyright. Like, I want to learn how to copyright. I, I want to have a passive income. I, I, want, I want to live in different places. And finally, he goes, dude, Sean, just do what you're good at. Your photos are beautiful. Focus on photography. Teach photography. And I look back at him and very seriously. I go, no way, dude. I'm not good enough. So how many of you guys have felt like, yeah, you're good at something, but you're not quite good enough to teach it? Have you, have you guys felt that way? Yeah, a lot of you guys have felt that way. That's perfectly natural, and we call it the imposter syndrome. When we know we're good at something, and of course you're not gonna be the best at what you do. There's better people somewhere in the world, but you are good enough to teach it. You don't have to be the best in the world to teach something. So Jesse looks back at me after I said that, and he goes, yeah, but you're better than somebody else. And this quote has stuck with me throughout my entire process of course creation, which I will soon get into. So I was like, okay, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna publish my first course. So I did, I published my first course on a platform called Skillshare uh, for reasons which I will get into. Skillshare is a online uh, course platform that you can post your courses on. My first course was on cafe lifestyle photography. It's basically like a hipster way to say food photography. Um, I was doing that on Instagram, and it was a style that I liked. I felt like I could teach it, so I did. Um, I filmed the course in a day with the assistance of Jesse. Nothing fancy. We had one camera. We had a mic that kept not working and all kinds of stuff. Um, it made $32 in the first month. Doesn't seem too significant, because it's not. And it made $344 in the second month. Once again, not a significant amount of money, but at this point, I had the confidence that I could do this. This $344 basically let me know 
that this is an income model that I can pursue. I can make passive income a reality by pursuing online courses on Skillshare specifically. So after that first course, I published my second course, and then my third course, my fourth, my fifth, my sixth, my seventh. And I was supposed to publish my eighth yesterday, but we all know how that goes. I bumped that back to next week, so hopefully I'll publish my eighth next week. And every time I published a new course, my income increased. In fact, here's my Skillshare passive income uh, from per month. Starting in April 2017, in the bottom left, I'm not sure if you guys can see that, that's $30. The next month, in May, it spikes up to $344, and then it goes down in September to a low of 78, and then it just shoots up, all the way up to $7,200 up there in October 2018. But what makes this, this graph a little bit more impactful is to look at when I published my courses. So you see the first one, published it, $344 the second month, and then like, what happened for the next six months? Well, I was still distracted, okay? I'm not gonna lie. I was still distracted, I was traveling, I was living my life here in Chiang Mai. I could have put out more courses, but I didn't. But you can see, by, by the sixth course, six, $6,500. Completely passive, right? Pretty awesome, pretty awesome. And when you're looking at this graph, I, I want you to notice a few things. Number one, this is less than two year period of time, less than two years, okay? The second thing is there's huge gaps in between each courses, from six months to three months, two months in some cases. I can tell you that I wasn't working the entire time during those, those breaks in between the courses. It didn't take me three months to publish a course. In fact, if I'm working on a course, it might take me a week, two weeks. So I was doing all kinds of stuff and I was still making this, this passive income. Uh, another thing to note, this is not reflective of my entire income. This is only my passive income from Skillshare. Um, so uh, something to think about is this could be a side hustle for you because it doesn't take that much time. So now, now we're getting to the point in the presentation where you're like, all right, dude, we know how much money you make. Cool. Um, yeah, we, we, got, we got your life. Yeah, good for you. Okay, well... What's this presentation actually about? Well, now, now that I've kind of given you guys my story, I want to get into speaking about how I did it and getting into the, the nitty gritty of how I found success on Skillshare's platform. So I'm going to start out, I'm going to talk about the overview of Skillshare, which is the platform that I use. Uh, I'm going to go into course marketing. I'm going to go into the anatomy of a good course. So what are the things that comprise a good quality online course? I'm going to go through my entire course creation process. So everything that I do when I go to create a course, uh, I'm gonna give you guys some basic shooting and editing tips just real quick. Uh, and then I'm gonna go through some uh, specific Skillshare tips that you should know if you do wanna teach on Skillshare's platform. So before we get into talking about Skillshare, I just wanna say that they're not paying for this at all. Um, I am a top teacher on the platform and I am a top teacher on the platform because my first few courses did very well. And what that means is they basically just give me extra marketing privileges but in no way are they paying for this or are they sponsoring this. I genuinely just love the platform. It's been very good for me um, and it's allowed me to live a lifestyle that I'm very grateful for. So why, why did I choose Skillshare when there's so many awesome online teaching platforms like Kajabi or Thinkific or Teachable or the one that a lot of us has heard of is Udemy, right? A lot of people have heard of Udemy. A lot of people have taken courses on Udemy, including myself. One of the reasons why I chose Skillshare was it was a new platform. In 2014, it was re-released as an open source platform, so anybody can go on there and publish a course, a video course. Another reason why is it focuses on art and small businesses. As a photographer, I thought that my content fit well on this platform. The vibe, the environment, I felt like it was for me. It's very easy to publish a course. You just sign up, you upload the videos, and you're good to go. Very good support as well. Um, it's a sub subscription-based model. And honestly, this is the number one thing that turns people off when they hear Skillshare. They go, oh, it's a subscription-based model? Okay, how do you make money? So essentially, the way Skillshare works is somebody pays $15 a month, and they get access to every course on the platform. First off, not a lot of money. $15 a month is not a lot of money. Seven of those dollars go to paying Skillshare, the upkeep, and things like that. The other half of that $15 goes to paying the teachers. And teachers are paid based on how many premium minutes are watched in their course 
every month, right? So you're counting on numbers. You're not counting on, on one person buying your course for $500. I'm going to get into this a little bit more why, in my case, that's a good thing. Um, you maintain the course rights, so you can publish on Skillshare, but then you can also just take your course and publish it on Udemy. You've got nothing to lose. Publish it on Udemy, publish it on Teachable, whatever. Put it on your website, mark it up. So if they don't even see the Skillshare one, you make a little bit more money through them. Um, and it has a huge on-site audience. And this is the single most important factor as to why I chose to teach on Skillshare as to other platforms, which I'm going to get into now. So on Skillshare, Skillshare will take a course that's doing well, that they like. If it's quality content, they will push it to the front of their platform. You can't pay to be on the front of, of Skillshare. Like you can on, on Amazon, if you want to get Amazon paid ads or YouTube, you can make sure people see your video, your product. You can't do that on Skillshare. If your course is good, they'll push it to the front. And there is no need for an existing audience. So remember how I said they have a huge on-site audience? You don't need to have an email list of 50,000 people or a YouTube channel of 100,000 subscribers or an Instagram with 50,000 followers. You don't need any of that to start on Skillshare. You can publish now, and if it's good content, people will see it. And I think that's why Skillshare is such an awesome platform for people like me who didn't have a following when they first started out. I didn't have an email list. I didn't have any of that stuff. It's very easy to trend and rank on Skillshare's platform. So if you publish a course, you get... 20 followers, 20 students in the first few days, you will trend. And what that means is you will be on the front page of Skillshare's website for your specific topic area. So if you're teaching business, uh, you'll be on the front page of the business thing. People will come through, they'll click your course, they'll watch it, um, and then you can, once they watch your course, in that course you can be like, hey, go check out my other course. So it's very easy to move students throughout courses. And courses hold their value over time. They hold a lot of on-site SEO which is great, so you can continue making that passive income. Actually, the, these two courses here, uh, the Instagram course and the smartphone photography course, these are my two most popular courses on Skillshare. The Instagram course has about 15,000 students, I believe. The smartphone photography has like 9,000 students. Um, and every day they get like 200 students, just organically. If you go on Skillshare and you type in Instagram, my course is gonna be one of the first ones that shows up. So even though I spent the last three months traveling and not doing anything, I still had the same paycheck that I did three months ago, which is awesome. And last thing, you can upsell products on your website. So if you have uh, some type of digital product that's related to your course content, you can sell that on your website and, and market it through your course. For example, I sell Lightroom presets. I'm a photographer, so Lightroom presets are basically like fancy editing filters for Adobe Lightroom, um, and I sell those on my website. So you can do that. Another thing I want to note about the subscription-based model on Skillshare is there's a very, very low barrier to entry to entering your course. Because they're already paying $15 a month, they're not worried about not getting every piece of information. When somebody buys a course on your website and they're paying $500, man, they're going to do their research. They're going to make sure that your course is perfect for what they're doing. But on Skillshare, I mean, they watch courses like they watch YouTube. Oh, this is okay? Okay, I'll just go on to the next one. So very low barrier to entry. People will very easily subscribe to your courses. But for me, marketing is not my main priority. Like I said, you don't need a huge audience to be on Skillshare. Skillshare does a great job of marketing for you. For me, the most important thing was to publish quality, authentic courses that teach the craft that I love, that teach photography, that teach the specific styles of photography that I like. Cafe lifestyle photography, travel photography, things that I love. So a little bit of background on my courses in particular. Um, they're 45 to 90 minute long video courses. So eight to 12 short videos, anywhere from four to, four, four to 15 minutes long. They're very concise. Um, like I said, because you're not selling a course for $500, people aren't expecting all the information in the world. So a lot of people um, will purchase a course online for five, six hundred dollars, and that course better have everything they need to know to pursue that field. On Skillshare, it doesn't have to be that way. It can be concise, it can be a little bit fluffy, you can put some emotional stuff in there. It should be practical, but it, yeah, it should be emotional. It should spark inspiration within people. And in fact, I try to balance my courses to have um, a lot of practical information, but have a lot of inspiration for people as well. I try to inspire them to go out and take pictures. 
Because that's what people want to hear. And if they finish your course and they're inspired, they're going to be happy. So a little bit of background on my course creation process. And I think this is relevant for, even if you don't want to teach on Skillshare, if you just want to teach on Teachable, if you already have a huge existing audience um, and you want to teach on another platform, I think this can, is, is relevant for everybody. So the first thing I do is I sit down and I create a list of potential topics, things that I could teach about, or things that I might be able to learn a little bit more about and then teach. I assess the topic popularity, so I'll go on Skillshare or YouTube or, or Udemy. I'll type in the topic and I'll see how many courses are on that. Notice how I didn't say competition here. Uh, and the reason for that is because if there's a lot of courses on one topic, that's simply because it's in demand. People want to learn that. So when I published my Instagram course, there was a ton of Instagram courses on Skillshare. And what I did was I went through them. This is number three. I went through these courses on, Skill, on Instagram and I broke them down and I figured out what they were doing right. I figured out what things they were missing and then I created my own outline based on those. Number four is cre create that outline. Fill in those gaps that those, those other courses that you watched are kind of missing. And then you're gonna film, edit, and publish. Filming and editing and publishing are the easiest parts of this thing. The most important thing is finding that topic. Quick timeline on, on Skillshare. For those of you that feel a little bit daunted by this process, it's incredibly easy uh, if you follow these steps. So list of potential topics. This can take anywhere from one to three days. This can take you 10 minutes. It depends on who you are. Um, so I put one to three days there. Uh, assess topic popularity, I said one day. You might take an hour to do this. Um, watch competitor courses, I said three days. Um, like I said, you can do this in a day. Uh, maybe you don't even, maybe you skip this step if there are no other courses on this topic, um, which there are a lot of gaps on Skillshare that need to be filled by experts like you guys. Um, and then I go ahead and outline the course, I say one day. But if I'm being honest, <laughs> most of my courses, I'll be like out drinking at a bar and I'll be like, oh shit, that's a great idea. And I'll just like hop on my notes and I'll create a really basic outline. And nine times out of 10, that's the outline that I will use for my course. I'll go through it and yeah, I'll, I'll maybe change a few things, um, but that's the basic outline. And then I'll go ahead and film the course one day. Very rarely does it go beyond that. Sometimes it's half a day. A lot of my courses I film in my room now. Um, edit the course one week. This might take you two weeks. Uh, and then publish the course. Pretty easy process. Could take anywhere from one to three weeks. So anywhere from 30 to 80 hours, depending on how much time you want to do. I mean, to be honest, it, it doesn't take that long. So selecting a topic. Like I said, this is the most important piece of the puzzle when you're going to be creating a course, selecting a topic. And I've come up with this, this mindset of you should find something that's in between your skill set, your skill set, and your, your passion. So what is your skill set? What are you good at? Are you a digital marketer? Okay, that's great. Well, then what is your passion? Are you passionate about digital marketing? Do it. If you're passionate about something else, find a middle ground there. What do people want to learn? So, I mean, if you if you are an expert basket weaver, that's awesome. But if people don't want to learn basket weaving, then you know you should kind of rethink your topic a little bit. Nothing against basket weaving, by the way. It's pretty cool. Um, so what did you struggle with when you started this thing that you want to teach? What, what were the, the struggles that you had? And lastly, I think this is a thing that a lot of people don't think about. What do you need to learn before you teach it? For those of us that, that have been to college or even in high school, do you think that your teacher just showed up to class and they knew everything that day? You're tripping. They went home the night before, they studied that information, and they made sure that they knew it so they could confidently teach it to their students. And that's the same way I am. I make sure I know the topic that I'm teaching about, even if it's not my expertise 100%. So I, I added this slide yesterday. We did a, we did a walkthrough, and, my, and some of the other speakers were like, you should talk about some topics that are in demand on Skillshare. And actually, Skillshare sends out a... a, a document every, every month or every year saying we need courses on these topics. These might be interesting for you guys. Digital marketing. Digital marketing is huge and there's a lot of different things within there that is in demand on Skillshare. Marketing automation. Luke, by the way, the MC, that dude knows how to do marketing automation. That guy's a genius. UI, UX, user interface, user design. A lot of people here do that. Super interesting stuff. Blockchain and cryptocurrency. 
Any blockchain people here? I'm sure there is. Steve? Web and mobile development. Outsourcing and business scaling. Working with remote teams and product development and planning. Guys, this is just some of the topics that are in demand on Skillshare. It's still a new platform. 2014 is not that long ago. There's so much room for growth on this platform. And one of the things I want to know is, this can be a side hustle for you. You can make this money on the side. For, it, that's what it was for me. I was still doing client work when I started. I was still traveling. It wasn't my main business. I'm certainly not doing this full time. This can be a side hustle for you. So a basic course outline that I want to go through for, for you guys. Introduction. These are all videos, right? Short videos, so a two to three minute introduction video. A course project video. So the way Skillshare works is you can have your students do a course project. Um, and the reason why that's important is because you get a lot of on-site SEO if they complete that project. So I make that project very easy. I'll have them post like two or three photos related to the content that I'm teaching just so they'll do it because I get a lot of on-site SEO and then my course will rank on the platform. I'll do a foundational lesson. So if that's a photography course, that might be like basic photography techniques, something like that. A uh, core lesson, in fact, I'll do three of those. Um, maybe more, maybe less. Uh, a supporting lesson, so maybe like essential apps that you might use. Uh, a tying it all together lesson. And then a conclusion. If you guys want this, by the way, you can email me after. If you're interested in teaching, you're serious about it, you can email me after and I'll, I can send this to you. So now I'm gonna go through one of my actual courses, the outline of that course. So introduction, course project. This is my Instagram course, by, way, by the way, my most popular course on Skillshare. And then I have a, a lesson called Establishing a Theme, how to create a theme on Instagram. That's a foundational lesson, that's why there's an F next to it. Uh, and then I have a quality content, another foundational lesson. Targeted hashtags, I put that as a core lesson. Targeted engagement and photo editing, both core lessons. Um, and then I have a third-party analytics, so software that you can use to track your Instagram growth and things like that. Uh, that is a supplementary lesson. Monetizing and working with brands, that's a core lesson, but it fits better at the end. It wouldn't make sense for me to put that in the middle. And then a conclusion. So it's, it's 10 videos, anywhere from, from four to, to 10 minutes long, like I said. So a little bit of filming tips here, and I, I don't wanna get too into this, but this is very important. And if you're, if you're an entrepreneur in 2019 and you're not doing video, I don't know what to tell you. Video is king right now. And as a photographer, I'm teaching myself video because I know how important it is moving forward. So if, I'm gonna, if I were to give you some very, very basic filming tips for filming a course or filming a YouTube video or whatever, have two cameras. And the reason why you have, should have two cameras is because you can hide your cuts. So if you're talking to camera A and then you stop and look at your notes, um, you can just cut it, cut to camera B, and then it looks like you never stop talking. So two cameras, position yourself next to a window. All you photographers in this room know that the light in this room sucks, unfortunately. And that's simply because there's, there's no natural light. Natural light is beautiful, the sun is huge. Shoot next to a window, put yourself next to a window and make sure the light is coming in from the side, hitting you nice and beautiful, creating that nice dark to light gradient across your face. Build a relevant set, so if you're a writer, like put some pens or something, I don't know, some, something relevant to what you do, you know what I mean? So I'll, I'll have like a camera in front of me. Uh, hire if you need to. I, was, I shot a course in Hanoi, Vietnam, and I hired a, a videographer to, to shoot with me for the day. Best decision I ever made. My course is so, such, so much better because I hired that guy. I'm so grateful. This is a, a little screenshot from that shoot there on the streets of Hanoi. Smartphones are okay. If you have a newer smartphone, you guys can film on that. Those cameras are insane, especially the new iPhones and new Samsungs. Like, you don't need an expensive camera to do this. And if you want to have that, then just go rent one. They're cheap. You can get one in Chiang Mai for like 500 baht for a day. Um, and I'd say if you're going to focus on one thing is ensure audio quality. Just pick up a mic. You can pick up a really cheap mic that plugs directly into your camera for like 30 bucks. So here's uh, a few of screenshots from my courses. So this, this first one is from the Instagram course on the left there. Uh, that's the front shot. It's kind of hipster. People on Skillshare like that. So you can see the windows to my left. Um, and I'm just sitting, I'm comfortable. It's not too like businessy, it's just casual. And then this is the camera B from my travel photography course. It's a side angle, it's kind of close up, just so I can hide those cuts. Some editing tips, um, I would say for, for any course, 
you don't need any fancy editing. Uh, just do simple cuts. So don't worry about like learning and editing software just before you do your course. It's, it's super easy. You just make a cut, that's it. Add relevant music, especially to the introduction video. And if I could give you one tip for, for any kind of video shooting at all, it's organization. The first thing I do after I finish filming a course is I go home, I import the footage, and I organize it. Because if I don't, it's gonna take me weeks to finish that course. Even if I go back the next day, I'm like, oh, I don't know. I'm just confused, like there's so, many, so much footage. So I'll create a folder for the course. I'll create a folder for each video. I'll create a folder for camera A, camera B, and I'll just put it in there. So Skillshare tips, I would say upload consistently. Um, if you can do once a month, that was my goal, but we all know how that went. Got a little bit distracted out here in Chiang Mai. Uh, upload consistently if you can. Try different approaches to the same topic. So instead of publishing a course that's five hours long, break that course up into five or six or seven courses. You have a ton of content and post them once per month. Um, have a really solid intro video. And the reason for that is because that's what's gonna sell your course. I spend the most time on my Skillshare classes on the introduction videos. I make them sexy, I add good music, I add B-roll, fancy edits, I make it look good because that's what people are gonna see before they enroll in your class. Spend time on the student project, make sure you include this, you want students to do that student project. Um, and also ask for reviews because reviews give you a lot of on-site SEO as well. So you wanna make sure that you're asking for reviews in the conclusion of your video. And I do wanna do a slide on this. You can upsell products. So actually a lot of my income now is also coming through preset sales that I upsell in my courses and things like that. It can only be an optional purchase. So you can't, um, it can't be mandatory for the completion of your course, uh, but you can have purchases to sell on your website. Have a good landing page. I think that goes without saying. You can, you can market this in your course, inside your course. So when you're speaking, you can be like, hey, go to my website, check out these presets. Or you can put it in your course bio and or both. And you can email students through Skillshare. So whenever somebody watches even the first video of your class, they're a student. And then you can email them. You don't get their email, but you can email them through Skillshare. So I have like 50,000 students. I can email them whenever I want. Um, I'll do like special student offers for them. I'll say, use this coupon code, Skillshare25, to get a discount. Um, and Skillshare is actually working to officially support this on their platform. So if I had to give you guys some lessons learned over the past two years of me pursuing this passive income model is distractions are everywhere, shiny object syndrome. There's things that we want to experiment with, drop shipping, copywriting, sexy things that we hear about people are making money. Um, stick with what works, stick with what you're good at, find something that you're passionate about um, and, and you're good at and stick with that. Remain open to suggestions um, and also have a mentor figure. And I know all the other speakers are gonna talk about this, Mentor figures can completely transform your business. I can tell you that even though Jesse is not directly involved in my business, the guidance he gave me early on was so helpful for me and I wouldn't be here today without him. So moving forward, uh, I wanna do one more course on Skillshare per month. Hopefully I can get that going. I also wanna experiment with a higher priced course on my website. So I wanna try selling a course for $500 on my website, a more comprehensive course. Um, with funnels and, and email automation, things like that. Of course, I wanna scale my social media presence and I also wanna experiment with paid advertising. So this has only been the beginning for me. I'm only two years in and I'm really excited for the future. Um, but that's all I got for you guys. If you are interested in, in learning on Skillshare or teaching, you can sign up through this link, skl.sh, uh, an abbreviation of Skillshare, slash learn with Sean. If you type in skillshare.com, it won't work. You have to use this link. Um, but that's all I got for you guys. Uh, any questions? Thank you, Sean. Please put your hands together for Sean. Thank you, Sean. Uh, one quick question. You mentioned you had hired a videographer in Hanoi. How did you go about finding a videographer in a new city? Yeah, so Facebook is super powerful. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with like the Jingle.